Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rutter, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterwards. Given that all participants will have their videos off and microphones muted throughout, uh, we'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you missed them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send to registrants or on our website. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the Q&A box, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentations. We'll also be answering some of the questions in the Q&A box live. There are automated captions available for this webinar, and you can turn them on by clicking on the up arrow next to the CC icon and then clicking on show subtitles. Before we begin, I wanted to share some background on American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC. It was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. And we continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramid featured on the current slide. Our work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. There are 30 species of hawks, falcons, and eagles in the United States, and as a group, they fall into every level of the ABC pyramid. Today, you'll hear from our panelists about this incredible group of birds with several species that connect people and countries as they fly across the Western Hemisphere every year. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. First off, we have Kelsey Griffin, who is an interpretive naturalist at the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota. The Raptor Center was established in 1974 as part of the College of Veterinary Medicine, and it sees about a thousand sick and injured raptors each year while helping to identify emerging environmental issues related to raptor health and populations. Lori Goodrich is the Sarkis Ecopian Director of Conservation Science at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. And she has studied and monitored raptor migration for three decades and conducts in-depth research on ecology of the broad-winged hawk, including tracking migrating birds from nesting to wintering areas in South America. EJ Williams is ABC's Southeast Region Vice President. She is working to stop the decline of migratory birds and enable conservation throughout their life cycle. EJ is a certified wildlife biologist and graduate of the National Conservation Leadership Institute. Joanna Eccles is ABC's Bird City Americas coordinator. Joanna comes to ABC with over 30 years of experience working for the Minnesota Zoo, Audubon, Minnesota, and other bird organizations. Joanna is known for her expertise related to bird window collisions and working with communities to increase habitat, reduce threats, and engage people in birding and conservation. Kelsey is going to start things off now by introducing us to our special feathered guests and share more about these incredible birds. Welcome, Kelsey, and an American and, kestrel. Yes, <laughs> this is uh, an American kestrel that we call Maller. Uh, not that he knows his name, but that is what we call him. So he is a great example of one of our education ambassador birds here at the University of Minnesota Raptor Center, um, who are birds that have been brought in through our clinic, which sees about a thousand wild raptors every year. Um, our goal is to get those birds back out into the wild so they can do their very important work of flying and hunting and eating small animals. But we do have some birds who are not able to be released. Um, and so a couple of those birds become education ambassadors with new jobs of teaching people about our shared environment and kind of the role that raptors play. So just to make sure we're all clear on what raptors really are, these are birds that have some incredible adaptations that uh, really allow them to be some of the top predators out in our ecosystem. They have these incredible, very big eyes for how relatively small they are. American kestrels are generally using these big brown eyes to find food out in big open grassy fields during the daytime. They also have, like all raptors do, these incredible feet, nice big strong feet with these curved sharp talons, perfect for grabbing onto small animals like mice, maybe some grasshoppers, dragonflies, maybe the occasional small bird as well. And then of course that curved sharp beak, perfect for tearing their food into small pieces. These are three adaptations that all raptors share. So regardless of the shape, the size, the habitat, uh, the diet, all of that can be different, but all of these raptors have those same adaptations. 
American kestrels, like I said, are generally found across most of North America in kind of big open grassland habitats. So these are birds that you normally see out in kind of more rural country areas, places where you have lots of big open grassy fields. You can also find them in some kind of city park areas, restored prairie grasslands. Actually, we'll see them in some marshy areas as well. So you can see them in a variety of kind of nice open grassy habitats. One time you won't really see them though, depending on where you're at in North America, is during the winter time. Here in Minnesota, these are birds that generally are migrating from kind of most of Canada and the upper portion of the uh, United States down to kind of Central America, the southern part of the United States. So these are birds that are going on some amazing migratory journeys, it can be uh, hundreds or even a couple thousand miles long, depending on where they're coming from. So they're doing a lot of nesting in a lot of our open prairie grassland habitats all summer long, and then traveling down south. Here in Minnesota, we're right on the Mississippi Flyway. So we do have a lot of birds passing through the Twin Cities right now. Um, so we're going to and going to continue as we get further into the fall. And American kestrels are one of those very important species that are going to be passing through. So these birds are going to be making that journey south. And of course, in the spring, they're going to be heading right back up north so that we can get back to replenishing American kestrel populations here in kind of the upper Midwestern portion of the United States. Um, they have some incredible adaptations that are helping them do that. I sense he's so fluffy and round right now. I have to show you some close-ups of this American kestrel. Uh, you can see those incredible dark stripes under the eyes. Oh, sorry, I think I'm talking too quickly. I'm so sorry. Uh, they have these incredible stripes underneath their eyes that are great for being able to find their food in the middle of the day and be able to make those really great um, kind of migration journeys as they're traveling during the daytime. And then of course, the very long pointy wing shape that will let them um, kind of be very quick and aerodynamic, really cutting through the wind, being able to swoop down and grab onto those small animals. And important for migration, right now, these birds are doing a lot of molting. They're finishing up their annual molt, growing in their new tail feathers. You can see all the different lengths of tail feathers on this American kestrel. I'm going to uh, hand us over to our education program director, John, um, where we're actually going to see another kind of raptor and talk a little bit about some of the birds who are not actually migrating all the way down to the southern part of the U.S. and Central America. So, John. Hi, and the reason I'm stepping in here is because uh, Kelsey is going to pick up another bird of master for you to look at um, in the second part of the presentation. But we showed you Mallard because he's migrating, uh, like most American kestrels are at this time of the year. And we here are a rehabilitation clinic and we receive wild raptors that have some sort of issue or injury in many cases. And we definitely see a lot of uh, in, uh, intakes of birds here in the fall and the spring during migration. And that's because bird migration is hard. Birds are traveling thousands of miles and those miles are treacherous and filled with lots of obstacles, either natural or human-based. And we see the result of that in our clinic here. Um, Maller is an example of that. Our Kestrel had a wing injury, presumably from some sort of collision. And uh, we see many other species also there and do our best to rehabilitate them and get them back in the wild. Um, we are gonna show you now, Kelsey's ready with ambassador number two, slightly bigger one. So I'll let her take over. Hard to do both birds at the same time. So thank you, John. <laughs> so this is one of our resident bald eagles we call Max, short for Maxime. And bald eagles are a bird that are really found all across North America. So far up into Canada, through all of the US and the very Northern part of Mexico. And so with that really wide range of habitats and kind of climate types, they have a couple different strategies for dealing with the kind of colder winter temperatures. So for kind of most of kind of these northern states and up through Canada, they're generally actually shifting around. They're not really fully migratory like a lot of other birds are, but they do shift their habitat kind of ranges around a bit to kind of make sure that they have fresh open water during the whole winter. Now open water, of course, is so important because bald eagles are catching fish. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we have this technology to give you some close-ups of this incredible, these big eyes, great for finding fish at the surface of water. And of course, down here, her feet, these big strong feet with those talons, great for grabbing fish right out of the water. And then of course, this big curved sharp beak, great for tearing fish into pieces, um, along with, of course, 
course, things that they might have scavenged, like roadkill, other dead animals, doing some very important kind of double duty between hunting live prey and also scavenging. So these birds, since they are um, kind of relying a lot on water for the most part, they need to shift around a bit during the winter. So for most of kind of the northern, again, Canada, the northern states, they're going to be kind of shifting around and actually congregating in some very large kind of groups, not so much flocks, they're not very social, but big kind of groups where there is open water year round. So we'll actually see these birds kind of all massing together in places where especially the Mississippi River is staying open, really large bodies of water like some of the Great Lakes. Um, a lot of times you'll see them on ocean coasts as well. So places like Alaska have a lot of bald eagles on the coastlines, even during the winter, as long as they have access to that water and some fish. So depending on kind of where they're at, they might shift around a bit. Now, like John was saying earlier with our migratory raptors um, and other migratory birds, there are a lot of hazards on the way. And we see kind of the results of that in our clinic here, especially during the spring and fall seasons. But our overwintering birds who've kind of shifted around and adapted to those cooler temperatures, they are also facing some issues as well. For example, bald eagles are facing problems that are very specific to one portion of the year, kind of the late fall, early winter time, especially during our major deer hunting season. Since as our main resident scavengers here in Minnesota in the upper Midwest during the winter, they are exposed to a lot of the spent lead, lead ammunition from deer hunting, as well as fishing tackle that is still using lead as well. So because of that, um, we do see a lot of bald eagles who are brought in with lead poisoning or elevated levels of lead in their system that we then need to treat. And that is one of the main things that uh, we see with a lot of bald eagles here at the Raptor Center Clinic. So not only are we trying to really hard to preserve a lot of these migratory birds that are really moving those incredible distances, but we also are really looking at ways to take care of the birds who are maybe moving around a little bit or staying put all winter long as well. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. We'll be around at the Q&A later on, but back to you, Jordan. Oh, thanks so much, Kelsey and all the birds and John. Um, absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. But now we're going to virtually move outside and hear from Lori, um, who's going to tell us more about hawk migration. So Lori, over to you. Okay, well, uh, it's great to be with everybody here today to talk about one of my favorite topics in the whole world, which is hawk migration. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, today, I'm, what I'd like to do is talk, is talk specifically about uh, diurnal birds of prey or the hawks, eagles, and falcons. And of, if we look, think about all the, the uh, hawks, eagles, and falcons in the world, there's about 200 species that undergo some kind of migration during uh, the fall and the spring period. In North America, there's a higher proportion, about 85% that actually undergo some kind of migration. And one of the really great things for us as bird watchers is that a lot of this migration occurs during the daytime. So if you're in the right place, you can actually see and, and enjoy and marvel at this wonderful movement of birds, like this peregrine falcon that we see here barreling down past Hawk Mountain. Um, now, the journey that these birds are taking varies between species. As was mentioned before, some species don't move at all. Some species move huge distances. This Swainson's hawk, for example, is one of the long distance migrants, and they can move uh, over 10,000 kilometers from the prairies of Saskatchewan and Western United States all the way into Argentina, where they spend the winter. In contrast, you might have something like the red-shouldered hawk, which only may migrate from New York State down into Virginia, as example. So there's a great variety in the distance that the birds are moving. If we think about raptors in general, a lot of them are pretty large birds, like this bald eagle, the rough-legged hawk, and the osprey that you see on the screen here. So they need to save energy during their movements, and this affects where they're migrating. In contrast, we do have smaller migrants like this Merlin that you see in the lower left that is less constrained and less needing to save energy. And they often do a flapping type of flight. In, in addition, we also have birds that are moving long distances like the Swainson's hawk I mentioned before or the osprey. And 
one thing to keep in mind is that different populations are doing different things sometimes. The ospreys in the east are a lot of them are crossing the water over the Caribbean into South America, where the Western birds are going down the land bridge of Central America. So different populations can be doing different things. One thing that raptors uh, take advantage of in the, in the fall and the spring is wind currents. Wind can be incredibly helpful in helping them save energy on their long journey. So one wind current, for example, is an updraft. And that occurs when you have windy days and it strikes a topographic feature like a mountain range or a coastline. And it creates this updraft that the birds can soar or glide in, just like your body surfing at the ocean. And this allows them to move long distances and save energy. And the other air current that can be found anywhere all across North America and South America is the thermals. Thermals occur wherever you have differential heating of the Earth's surface. And where you have a south slope is one possible location for a thermal, but over cities and roadways will get strong thermals because of the pavement. So birds see these thermals, they, they put themselves in it and they can rise up um, without any energy at all. And then when they get to the top, glide off to the next thermal. And this is also a very effective way of migration. So what you see when birds are moving south in the fall or north in the spring is that we get concentrations of these migrating raptors along coastlines and mountains in particular, and possibly along habitat features, for example, the, the Mississippi River in the central United States. And so these habitat features and topographic features concentrate the migration. Another important factor affecting migration is weather. So certain conditions like cold fronts in the fall season bring north winds across large component of the, of the landscape or the, of the North America. And with the north wind, the birds are, that are heading south have a nice tailwind, which will give them a little extra push. So then we often see lots and lots more birds migrating during those conditions. And the flip, is, flip side is true in the spring, south winds will bring more and more uh, migrants and particularly concentrating them along these topographic features. So this is something to look for when you're wanting to get out and go hawk watching. One um, exciting thing about raptors in migration is that they form these, that some species like the broadwing hawk, Swainson's hawk, Mississippi kite, and turkey vulture, they can form these large flocks on migration. And actually this week, and in fact yesterday, was a big movement of large flocks of broadwing hawks across Eastern and Central United States. And there were numbers of five, four or 5,000 birds at a time being seen in New England. And uh, we here at Hawk Mountains had 1,400 broadwing hawks fly over. So this is a really exciting time of year to get out and try to see migration. Of course, as these flocking birds continue to move south, they collect in larger numbers uh, at, on their journeys. So when you get down to Texas for these long distance migrants like the Broadwing and the Swainson's Hawk and the Turkey Vulture, you get huge flocks of tens of thousands of birds at a time passing over. These are photographs from Mexico and from Panama. So it's very exciting to try to uh, get out and see the birds during this peak migration period when the numbers can be so large. Now, hawk watching is an easy sport to get involved with. It started back in the 1930s at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. We started one of the first scientific uh, samples of migrating hawks. And uh, since then, we've had a, a staff member or a volunteer posted at the lookout every fall season from uh, August, mid-August through mid-December, and also now in the spring as well. But fortunately for everyone here, there are hawk watches now that have sprung up since 1934 all over the continent, from Alaska down south, all the way into Columbia now, you can find a hawk watch. So pretty much everybody on this call, our Zoom call, will probably be able to find a hawk watch that they could go to uh, in, their back, in their near backyard. There's over 200 of them. And most of these sites 
are manned by experienced observers or counters, as we call them. And these people, whether they're volunteers or staff, are often calling out the birds that they're seeing. So all you have to do is visit the site, like you see here at Hawk Mountain, uh, settle yourself down near some experienced observers and begin to enjoy the migration. And just to give you a feel for what these sites look like, um, they're not all rocky mountaintops. Some of them are, are you, you can bring a folding chair and set up your camp, your, uh, your, um, your canopy, or you might have to hike in, in Nevada. Those Shoots Mountain is a famous watch site run by Hawk Watch International with a two, about a two hour hike up to the top. But once you're there, it's a spectacular view. And the Was Mount Wachusett is just west of Boston is an easy place to get to with a huge parking lot there to, so you can walk right up to the Hawk Watch. And if you go farther south into Mexico and Panama, actually, for some reason, the conditions are even more cushy. We have uh, chairs provided already for you. So how do you find a place to go watch hawks? Well, there is this count site, or sorry, website called hawkcount.org. And all you do is log onto that, that website and there's a there's a, a app there that's called, called Find a Hawk Watch. And when you go in there, you can select a state, province, or, or country, click on it, and then it'll show you all the hawk watches that you could possibly visit. Keep in mind that some of these are spring hawk watches and some of them are fall hawk watches. So to learn more about each hawk watch, what you want to do is click on the red dot and then you can read about the site profile. There'll be directions in there. There'll be information on, on when the peak flights are and what you might need to bring to, um, to visit. And, and uh, all, usually there's a Google map so you can see exactly where they're located. So when you're getting ready to go to your, your site that you've already selected, uh, of course, the next question is, when do I go and what should I bring? And uh, what you wanna do is look at those same web, that same website and zoom in and find this uh, timing map. And this is the one for Hawk Mountain. And what you can see here is that in the fall, we wanna watch hawks between September, October, and November primarily. That's when the peak flights are, or March, April, May in, in the spring. And uh, on the red arrow here, you can see that broadwing hawks are at peak migration right now. And this is pretty much true for all of Eastern North America. And go, but if we wanna see golden eagles, we're gonna wanna visit our hawk watch site somewhere in late October. And we have the same kind of information on that website for Western United States. This is the Goshoots Mountain in Nevada. And you can see that September and October are pretty much a good time to go to visit uh, to see both broadwing hawks and golden eagles. So the timing can differ between different parts of the continent, as it makes sense. And what to bring? Uh, certainly binoculars are very important. Uh, dress comfortably, bring layers, extra layers. It can always be cold when you're out in the wind watching hawks. Uh, a seat cushion or a chair, depending on where you're going. Uh, sunglasses, hat, sunscreen, water, and of course, uh, depending on the hike, you might need to wear some hiking boots. But so check that information about where you're going and you'll, you'll have good cues on what you wanna bring. Field guides, there's tons of great field guides for, for identifying hawks in flight out there. There's even an app. The Hawk Watch International website has a free app you can download to your phone that also helps identify hawks. If you just wanna start out with something less expensive, go to the Hawk Migration of North America website. You can get this two page brochure. It's very inexpensive and uh, that'll give you a good start. But let me give you a quick tip before I end. And that is when you're watching Hawks in flight, you wanna not be looking for listening for songs or looking at colors. You wanna really focus your eyes on body shape and flight behavior. For example, we have a Budio over here on the right, which is a broadwing hawk, and they have broad wings and wide tails, and they do a lot of soaring. Compare that to the falcon, which is at the bottom with these long pointy wings, and they often fly with a flapping flight, so strong, long wings with a lot of flapping. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that you're gonna watch for 
Um, but you're, when you go to these sites, there always will be somebody there that can help you get started. So I'm going to end there and just say that there's lots of links here. I think um, the websites for Hawk Mountain, Hamana, and um, hawkcount.org will be great places to start. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lori. So there was so much information, which was really great, but we're going to make sure that you all get that, whether it's on our website or in the follow-up email, because we are recording this webinar, so don't worry if you can copy that all down fast enough. Um, but now we're going to move over to EJ, who's going to tell us about swallowtailed kites and current research happening to track their migration. So EJ, take it away. Thanks, Jordan. Um, and thanks for joining us today. So I get to talk about one of my all-time favorite birds, the strikingly beautiful, elegant swallowtail kite, and particularly some work that we've been doing with kites this year um, in South Carolina. Okay. My slides aren't changing. There we go. So kites are found in, you know, throughout the hemisphere. First, that I'm going to be talking about are the swallowtail kites that migrate between the southeastern United States and South America. And what's really interesting about this population is it underwent an extreme contraction of both the population and the range in the early or late 1800s, early 1900s. And whereas they used to nest in 21 states, now they just nest in six states right in the most southern part of the southeastern United States. And when those birds are here in the southeast, they're looking for a mosaic of forest conditions for their breeding habitat. So they're looking for open areas as well as forested areas, particularly with really big trees where they can put their nests. And they find those conditions in natural areas. This is Big Cypress Swamp down in southern Florida. They also find those habitat conditions in working forests. And we have working forests that overlap the swallowtail kite range throughout the southeastern U.S. That overlap has provided us with a really unique partnership. And so we've been working with International Paper Company, as well as the Avian Research and Conservation Institute, to better understand how these kites use this working forest landscape. So uh, we were able to capture three kites in South Carolina this year in June. And so how do you catch a kite? Um, well, of course, first you take care of all the proper permits from the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and permissions from the landowners. And then you need sort of three basic elements. First, you need a swallowtail kite nest. And you can find these. Um, they're going to be in a really tall pine. Um, it helps to have a little kite sitting in the nest calling. And Spanish moths hanging down from the bottom is very diagnostic. Um, the next thing you need is a big mist net that you can set up in an open area fairly close to that nest. And then the third thing you need is the arch enemy of the swallowtail kite. Now, not Nicole. She's a sweetheart that works at a re rehab center similar to the Raptor Center that we heard about earlier. But what you need is a great horned owl. These are major predators of swallowtail kites. And so this is Nonami, a rehab owl, and Nonami goes on a perch right at the base of the nest. And when that bird is out there close to a kite nest, it causes alarm and, and great action from the swallowtail kite. So the birds swoop in at the owl and get caught in the mist net. And of course, as soon as that happens, we erupt out of the blinds next to the net, get hands on the bird so it doesn't bounce out of the net, and then very carefully extract that swallowtail kite out of the mist net so that we can work it up and attach a radio transmitter. So the other thing you want when you're catching swallowtail kites is you want the expert. And in my mind, Gina Kent and um, Ken Meyer are the best in the business when it comes to swallowtail kites and many other um, raptors and birds that they study. And they've been working with kites since the late 90s. I think they've captured and radio tagged um, over 400 birds. So they're just awesome to work with. And so once we get these birds out of the net, we name them based on where we caught them. And so we had a bird from Carter's Bay, a big hardwood bottom. 
a bird from Peters Creek, which is a tributary of Carver's Bay, and a bird from Brig Big Branch, another tributary, which is important because that connectivity really supports the social needs of these birds during the breeding season. And so once we got the birds out of the net, we do the workup with sort of the typical measurements of wing, tail, leg, beak. And then we place this very elegant, sleek little transmitter on each bird, very carefully fitted. And the transmitters actually download once a day to a cell phone tower and download about 20, 25 locations for that 24-hour period. And that helps us understand how the birds are moving and how they're using the landscape. So in just that short time since June, we've been able to learn so much about how these three kites are using this working forest landscape in South Carolina. And you can see there's a lot of interaction. Blue is Big Branch, orange is Carver's Bay, and pink is Peters Creek. You can see they have some different movements. It gives us insights into important areas for roosting, maybe where one of the nests is that we didn't lay eyes on this year. But we're learning a lot, and that information we transfer to forest managers on the landscape so they can incorporate practices into their forest management and ensure that this landscape is sustainable for kites well into the future for nesting and raising their young. It also gives us a way to talk to landowners that may have kite nests located on their property about what they can do to help conserve kites. And of course, the really exciting stuff starts to happen when the birds start to move south. Our three birds left um, South Carolina in late August, early, South, early September, and um, Big Branch and Carver's Bay, so our two blue, blue and orange, they left in late August, and they're currently in northern Honduras. And then um, Peters Creek was the last to leave and head down through Florida and then across the Gulf of Mexico, and he's currently in the Yucatan um, Peninsula of Mexico. And these birds, of course, will continue moving south, cross the Andes, and eventually end up in Brazil or Bolivia, Bolivia, where we'll be able to better understand what's going on on the wintering grounds. And then, of course, when they come back in the spring, we'll be able to learn more about how they're using the landscapes in South Carolina. And because we were so successful this year, we're actually going to be able to expand our work across the full range of the kites. So over the next three years, we'll be working with kites from South Carolina all the way over to Louisiana. Now for fall migration, if you want to see fall tail kites, you'll have to use um, Laurie's app and probably find one of those hawk watches south of the U.S. because most of the kites have already departed for Point South. Um, the good news, though, is they're really early migrants. So when you start jonesing, you know, after a long winter without any migrants, when you need a migrant, kites are going to hook you up. They start getting back into Florida in February, and you can see them carrying nest material as early as March. And so look for these birds early. Um, we want to know if you see them. It really helps fuel our research. And then the other thing I want you to do right now is on your calendars, put down a trip to the south in August. And I know that may sound counterintuitive, but Kites get in these big foraging aggregations in late August and early September. We're talking 80, 100, maybe as many as 200 kites. It can be a mixed flight, flight of swallowtail kites and Mississippi kites. And they find these fields, particularly hay fields, that have big green June buttles, beetles that are rising up. And these birds actually catch those beetles while they're flying eat them while they're flying, and then make a loop over this same field and catch another one. And this can go on for a couple of hours in the morning. And once they find a field they like, they stay there for a week or so. And you may be able to stand on the side of the road and be 20 or 30 yards from this huge aggregation of kites feeding actively over these fields. And of course, now with eBird and other tools, you can find these spots and, and go and observe this just very predictable bird spectacle. So I encourage you to do that as soon as you can um, in, in August of one of the coming years. So with that, thank you, of course, for joining us today. Um, thanks to our partners in International Paper and ARCI, as well as the landowners and managers that we work with at Resource Management Service, Forest Investment Associates, and White Oak Forest Management. Thanks so much, EJ. Oh, I can't wait yeah. to get out and see them, like you said. So 
Next up, we are going to hear from Joanna, who's going to tell us all how we can help raptors in our own backyards. So Joanna. All right, just getting everything turned on properly. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And I'm gonna wrap with some ideas for how we can help raptors. We've got a lot of questions about this. Um, and it's a big part of what we are working on. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about this question in creating our Bird City program. Bird City basically guides communities in working together locally to help birds of all kinds, including raptors. And the great thing about helping birds is that we also create beautiful and more healthy communities for people too when we help birds. So everybody wins. All right, so I am going to, hang on, get these, there we go. Um, we could spend hours on any of the topics that I'm gonna touch on. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about kind of three key things you can do to help raptors. And the first one sounds kind of simple, but the first thing you can do is learn. So being here today, interested and engaged is really the start. Um, then you can take that interest out into whatever sphere of influence you have, and you'll be able to help raptors and other birds. Um, in addition to that knowledge and education, the two other key things that we all need to do um, are to increase habitat and then reduce threats to birds. So these are kind of the three pillars of Bird City specifically, but also kind of the three pillars of creating more bird-friendly communities in general. So starting with habitat, because to habitat loss is really the most serious issue that faces all wildlife, no matter what it is. And so we really need to do something pretty simple, which is creating habitat anywhere and everywhere possible. <laughs> Some people have the ability to do that in front yards, uh, or backyards, um, along boulevards, if this is the way your community is set up, this is a critical area that can serve to make habitat connections. Uh, boulevard rain gardens often replace grass, which is a good thing, and they improve water quality while they add habitat to a place that, again, was formerly grass. Uh, wetland buffers are another place where a little less mowing can actually provide habitat while also improving water quality, so something to think about. So if you mow, which a lot of people do, the first thing to do is consider if some of that area could provide habitat instead. So that's a place to start, create habitat anywhere and everywhere. Next, when we do have that opportunity to create habitat, what do we plant? So again, this is a whole hour or more in itself. So in a nutshell, because we live in all different places, just suffice it to say that wherever you are, seek to plant native plants. So native plants are those plants that normally naturally would live in your area. And that's important because of this sort of simple equation. Uh, it's, it's about the plants to a degree, but it's really more about the plant insect connection. So native plants and insects have co-evolved over millions of years, and that's where insects are found. They simply can't eat these uh, often alien plants that dominate typical urban and suburban environments. Uh, and that's important because virtually all birds must feed their young insects. So these hardworking parent birds, they have to be able to find lots of insects. They have to be able to find them fast. Uh, and the best image that I can kind of give you to uh, kind of keep in your mind is a vision of picture fake plants and picture bird feeders. If you plant a native plant, you have planted bird feeder. If you plant an exotic, it could be that you have basically planted uh, a fake plant, like from a hobby store, that kind of thing. So without the native plants, we don't have the insects. And without the insects, these birds can't raise those hungry chicks. So of course, that's important to bluebirds, but we're talking about raptors here. And of course, it's also important to raptors. Native plants create the entire food web that raptors need, uh, including insects and rodents, 
can see I really like kestrels. <laughs> and uh, the lizards, for example, that kestrels need. Um, kestrels also feed on birds, as do other falcons like merlins, cooper's hawks, and of course, peregrines. All these birds need these resources during all parts of their life cycle. So native plants really do matter in creating this diverse food web that raptors need. Another thing you can do is leave dead trees standing. So native plants include trees. Trees are a primary, primary like provider of those that insect food, um, both during and after their life. So trees can also turn into essential perches, uh, nesting, hunting habitat. So wherever possible, help raptors by leaving dead trees standing. And also consider your maintenance. Uh, you can help raptors by timing that maintenance, like mowing and trimming, to avoid disturbing them during breeding. Um, a lot of birds actually nest on the ground, especially grassland species, like uh, this is a northern harrier. Um, and grasslands are really very threatened habitat. So one thing we can do is do our best to delay mowing of any large areas um, that might be serving as nesting habitat. And habitat loss is generally considered the greatest threat to birds. And of course, there's a lot of other threats that we're all working to address. So I'm gonna just touch on a few of these uh, and give you some practical tips. Um, can't mention threats without mentioning cats. And while cats aren't a huge factor for raptors, uh, free roaming cats really are a devastating problem for birds and mammals, which again are the foundation of the raptor's diet. So keeping cats indoors um, is safer for everybody, including the cats. <laughs> um, windows are also a leading cause of bird mortality. And while a lot of raptor species are known to hit windows, uh, this is actually a stunned barred owl that's hit a window. Um, there are some species that are more susceptible to window collisions than others. So peregrines, um, who have adapted really well to living in urban areas, um, they really have to learn to navigate that very dangerous environment. Um, and many, especially sometimes young birds, um, end up hitting windows. So again, we do whole lengthy workshops on this topic. So I'm gonna just show you three slides that depict like the biggest sort of categories of fixes. If you're looking to fix uh, windows at your own home or at a building maybe that you work at or um, in your community. So first, the first category of fixes is putting some kind of visual marker on the surface of the glass. So it doesn't stop birds physically from hitting the window, but visually it tells them don't fly here. And similarly, you can hang things in front of a window. Um, again, not a physical barrier, but a visual one. And lastly, you can put a physical barrier in front of the glass to keep birds from hitting it. And a good example of that would be a window screen. So if you're building or renovating and have an option, a great thing you can do is install, install windows with external screens. Uh, moving on to other threats, toxins are a serious concern for raptors, so limiting your use of pesticides, herbicides, and especially rodenticides. Um, raptors get poisoned when they eat poisoned prey, no matter what that prey is. And I'll close with lead. Uh, eagles pick up lead, um, as Kelsey mentioned, from scavenging on carcasses or gut piles from animals. Um, usually deer uh, that have been hunted with lead ammunition. So um, even just a tiny fragment of lead is all that it takes to kill an eagle or other scavengers like vultures. So if you hunt, uh, consider the switch to non-toxic alternatives if you haven't already, um, and really help all of us by spreading the word on that. It's a really important one. Uh, raptors are amazing, of course. We really appreciate you sharing this time to celebrate them. So keep learning and finding whatever ways you can to create a more bird-friendly community within your sphere of influence. Thanks and more in the questions. Thanks so much, Joanna.
So we are going to move into the Q&A portion of our webinar now, and all of our presenters will be on camera to start answering some of the most common questions that came in during the registration, and then we'll move to answering some of the questions that came in during the presentation. So we are a, a bit tight on time, so I'll hopefully get a few rapid fire questions um, from all of you. And the first one we're going to start with, and we'll start with um, <laughs> with the live birds, because this will be a, a hopefully good question for them, which is, what is your favorite tip to IDing us? Uh, what's, what, what is your favorite tip to help ID raptors? So Kelsey, if you can go first. Ooh. Um. That's a very broad question. Um, so for identifying raptors, um, in general, I mean, as always, I feel like I'm internally legally obligated to point out the allaboutbirds.org. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar, um, but they are fantastic and have a lot of great side-by-side -side pictures, um, which for raptors, you're dealing with a lot of birds that there's a lot of brown and dark gray and white kind of coloration. They all look very similar. I'm so sorry about everyone's eardrums. Um, so, so they can be very tricky to tell apart. So really looking at the wing shape and the kind of proportion of the head and the tail when the birds are in flight, I find is really the most helpful since as a lot of us know with a lot of birds, trying to judge by color is very difficult, but with raptors especially so because there's not so much kind of variation. So that'll be my main tip is looking at the kind of outline and shape. Thanks. And Lori, you shared so many great things in your presentation. And again, we'll make sure that those things get passed on to our viewers. But do you have a favorite that you'd like to highlight? Uh, I would agree with shape and flight behavior that uh, you can really narrow things down very quickly. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some field marks like the whitehead on a bald eagle that give, give it away right away. But, um, but yeah, shape and, and proportions. EJ? Um, well, I do like sound, you know, even with raptors, um, and, and also um, how they move, you know, their, their activity and their, um, their patterns. And of course, Laurie alluded to that as well. So, yeah. And Joanna. I'll just wrap by saying with all birds, I always just think time, study them, watch them. So go to these places and be around these experts and watch and just study and, and, you will be amazed at how much your mind picks up on these little details of movement. And then when somebody at those counters, they always count them off like, oh, that's a this, that's a that. Ask them like, what are you watching for? Don't ask them when there's like 1500 broad wings overhead, but ask <laughs> them when there's a quiet moment about like, what do you notice? And what are you watching for? Cause they really, um, they really know. And you'll learn too. <laughs> I completely agree. And speaking of counting, Lori, can you tell us a little bit about how raptor populations are doing and if there are any specific species that we should be concerned, or concerned about or really celebrate successes? Yes, so Hawk Mountain and three other organizations uh, are part of, part of something called the Raptor Population Index Project. And we do analyze the trends from all these migration sites in uh, try to identify you know, how raptors are doing. So the good news is the bald eagle, like our friend here, are doing quite well all across North America. They're seeing increases in every state, uh, both as breeding population as well as migrating birds. So that's good news. Uh, vultures are doing well as, as well. Um, but some of the species that we're concerned about the most are some of our smaller raptors, like the American kestrel that was shown earlier uh, they're showing uh, widespread declines throughout the eastern United States and uh, have been for over 20 years. So we're, we're involved with some research here to try to figure out what the problem is. But the other uh, species that we're concerned about um, has come up more recently is the sharp-shinned hawk, uh, which is a forest nesting raptor and may seem somewhat common to people when they're out, out and about, but we've seen uh, significant declines in numbers of sharp-shinned hawks at almost half of the hawk watch sites across North America, which is a little unusual. And it are also, also showing declines on Christmas bird count. So that suggests that it's not a short stopping behavior that's going on like we might suspect, but something might be going on in the forests, uh, boreal forests and conifer forests to our north here. Um, Northern goshawks are also showing widespread declines 
and uh, northern harriers, which is a grassland species that, that uses similar habitat to the American kestrel. So they've been showing some, some long de declines. But, um, but yeah, all of those are species that we would like to see more research on and also more conservation activities. Thanks, Lori. All of that really highlights the more research in general, but I'm assuming also for full annual life cycle, full annual year research. So EJ, could you maybe elaborate on how that research is, is needed or done? Um, tell us more about the actual research you're doing with the kites and why, why can't you just observe them uh, at one point of the year or in one place? <laughs> Right, right. Well, fortunately for kites, they're pretty stable, um, pretty low numbers when you think about it, you know, 150,000 global, 11,000 that breed in the southeastern U.S. Um, but, you know, you think about it, they have to they have to be successful all 12 months of the year. You know, they don't they can't take a month off. And so we have to think about what they need during the breeding season. Migration is a particularly perilous time for birds. And so they've got to have both safe passage and they've got to have stopovers, you know, in those places. So, you know, we watch what's going on on the Yucatan Peninsula for kites because almost all the kites that come from the eastern U.S. go across and stop at the Yucatan. And so those um, stopover sites are very critical. And then the wintering grounds. And we know there's a lot of change in the um, those open grasslands that mix with forests in Brazil. You know, we've lost a lot of that and, it's, and the um, agriculture has intensified greatly. So we definitely have to pay attention to what's going on on all those. And we're actively doing research on raptors and a lot of other birds to understand the limiting factors, you know, so we can best target our conservation to, to where those, you know, pinch points are during that annual cycle. So, so it's critically important. Um, and we've got such neat tools now. You know, kites are big enough, you can put a decent sized transmitter, but we've got, you know, tiny geolocators and just so much great technology that really helps us be able to know what these birds are doing and how to target our conservation. Thanks, EJ. So speaking of all of those threats, um, Joanna, you did a great job of saying how we can help people maybe in our own backyards or communities, but are there other threats that raptors face uh, throughout the year that you didn't get to mention that you'd like to highlight? Um, are there any ways that you know people can take action or things that we should be aware of? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things that we grapple with that are, um, th they kind of leave the, the backyard sphere of influence, you know what I mean? Um, a couple of big things that came up in the questions, um, wind, wind power, you know, all the renewable energy conflicts with birds are such a challenge because of course we need renewable energy to climate, combat climate change, which is also a huge threat to, to birds. Um, some people are putting it, you know, up there with habitat loss because climate has such an effect on habitat. So we really need renewables. And so things like wind is definitely a threat to raptors and some more so than others. So um, we at ABC and other organizations are doing a lot of work on figuring out how best to site wind projects so that we can potentially have wind projects and do the least harm. Of course, there's so many, uh, so many players in that game. And so that can be a challenge, but we are working hard on specific projects, but also on policy and things like that. Uh, the main issue with wind turbines for raptors is collisions and turbines are often located in you know, open areas or on these ridge lines that like uh, Lori so perfectly showed with these the same places that raptors are using. Um, and with all collision impacts, it often comes down to the fact that all these structures, turbines, power lines, buildings, they were not threats that birds evolved to face. So raptors, other birds, they don't really fly around as if we would. When we were flying, we'd be looking in front of us, right? But Birds don't, their world is different than ours. So they're not necessarily paying attention to what's in front of them. A raptor might be hunting, um, bird, small birds might be looking for the raptor that's hunting, you know? So um, that's, that's 
the crux of the problem is that um, a lot of these things are just not in their wheelhouse to know or know how to um, worry about. So we're working on things we can work on finding the ways to encourage smart wind development, smart window, you know, building um, uh, design and things like that. Uh, it's not an easy answer, but um, a lot of people are working hard on that. There is an opportunity for people to comment the Fish and Wildlife Service. This is going to seem a little but the Fish and Wildlife Service is in the process of um, changing their rules on what we call incidental take. And that is basically mortality that happens, you know, that we, it's not intentional, but we can predict it. And so that's an opportunity for people to, any people, anybody can comment on, during the US Fish and Wildlife Service's comment period and the more comments they get, they have the the more they will realize how important protecting raptors is, while we also invest in renewables. So sorry, that was long, but it is a convoluted web we've woven. No, thank you, Joanna, um, Kelsey, and and Max. Do you want to speak maybe to some of the ratio of the birds that you see at the Raptor Center in terms of the the threats that that these birds come in? as victims of. Yeah, so, and again, apologies in advance. If there's loud noises, <laughs> trying to strategically mute. Um, yeah, so uh, kind of depends on the kind of general size of the bird. So bald eagles, especially, um, one of the main things that we see, we actually do test all of the bald eagles that are brought in, which is a couple hundred every year. Um, we do test all of them for elevated levels of lead in their bloodstream, and the vast majority of them do have lead in their system. Uh, all of that lead is going to be come from, coming from human activity. Again, generally because of their both um, fishing and then scavenging kind of lifestyles is going to come a lot of from the either fish or waterfowl or the deer carcasses that they may be consuming. Um, so all of that we know is coming from humans. Um, we are also seeing, um, we see a variety of collision injuries as well. It's probably kind of the biggest um, kind of thing that we see are collision injuries, but that is a really broad kind of uh, a broad spectrum of things that could be anything from vehicles, since we do have a lot of raptors where kind of the way that highways are structured really mimics a lot of their natural habitat. I mean, you see red tail hawks. Uh, really all over those light poles, electrical poles, things like that, um, along with bald eagle scavenging and turkey vulture scavenging great horned owls swooping down to catch mice on the other side of the road at night. Um, we really mimicked their habitats really well and created a great place for them to live other than vehicles um, and then windows in cities, things like that. So um, that's probably the highest kind of percentage of birds that we're seeing. Um, with bald eagles, we're seeing lead, <laughs> lead exposure for most of them um, and along with collision injuries as well. So it's kind of the main kind of sets of things um, that we're seeing. Along with lead, I should also mention other, um, since Joanna mentioned it too, those other environmental contaminants, especially rodenticides in our red tail hawks and great horned owls. Um, so a great message for everyone too, of if we are you know, working on pest control, it's really important that we do that. We don't want to be spreading diseases or things like that, but we do also want to do it in a way that's not going to be making our kind of top predators sick as well. Uh, so those are kind of our, our main kind of takeaway points from the birds that we're seeing in the clinic is a lot of those kinds of issues. Thanks, Kelsey. Well, um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we're just going to take one more question before our final question. Um, and anyone can jump in, but Lori, I'm hoping you can at least start. And the, the question is about how raptor migration is changing. What are we observing as climate change continues to be impacting these birds? Extreme weather, especially out west, um, hurricanes, tropical storms. Is there any way that you can quickly summarize? Yeah, yeah. The, um, there's a lot of data showing that, that timing of migration, in, particularly in partial migrants like your sharp shin hawk and red tail hawk is changing. So then the fall, they're migrating later because they can, um, and the weather's not as severe in the northern latitudes. Uh, and then in the spring, they can return earlier. So they are responding much more quickly than I would have guessed to those kind of shifts. So we are seeing timing changes. The timing changes are not, not happening as much with your long distance migrants, like your broad wing swainsons and osprey. They seem to be more on a schedule. But we've seen a little bit of shift um, in faster migration northward because of the stronger thermals with 
with um, warmer temperatures in the south, but not a lot. Uh, and then with storms, I think it's, and the fires, it's something that we still are trying to figure out uh, because it's happened so fast, but obviously it disrupts their migration patterns. They might have to go around things uh, and they might have higher mortality. We just don't know. I do know from my experience tracking broad wings that uh, there was a huge hurricane in Texas for over seven days and we had one bird just sit it out and then they migrated north, they made it, but another bird went completely different route went west and then north and then east again. So they may have different strategies of how they handle it. Thanks, Laurie. So as I mentioned, unfortunately, our time is, is closing out. Um, so our last question that all of our speakers are going to answer is this one. So five seconds while I read it. What is one thing that you hope everyone takes away from this webinar and goes and tells a friend? And Max, you're up. <laughs> So she would me. like fish very badly. Um, <laughs> so bringing her fish, clearly. Um, and then also the um, kind of the ability that people have to make a difference. I mean, all of the birds that we see here at the Raptor Center are birds that were helped by individual private citizens out living their lives. So things can feel very daunting and very scary, but we actually do really have a tangible ability to make a difference, even if it's one bird at one time. We can do something, and I think that that's really important. Thanks, Kelsey. Lori? I would just say habitat, um, that was mentioned before, is so critical to birds on migration. They need places to sit down, whether it's a park in a city or a wild field pasture along a migration route. So being able to protect habitat wherever you are is great. And EJ? Get out and see them. You know, that's the great thing about raptors. You don't have to have the best binoculars. You don't have to be particularly good at finding birds. They're big, they're beautiful. So get out and enjoy them and appreciate them. And then that'll drive, you know, your ability to help them. So, so get out and enjoy them. It's all about the kettle is what I say. <laughs> Joanna, <laughs> ditto, just wrapping up. Keep it simple, start where you are, increase habitat, reduce threats, keep learning and, and loving them. <laughs> well, thank you to our speakers and thank you to all of our audience members for attending and for all of your great questions. Um, as you learned, raptors are absolutely incredible birds and make amazing journeys across the Western Hemisphere. They deserve protection and support wherever they go, and you can make an immediate impact for them and other bird species by taking action and by supporting ABC's most urgent conservation projects. So please donate through the link in the chat or on our website, and we and the birds really appreciate your consideration. Again, thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it. I hope you see some raptors and enjoy fall migration. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.